in God's eye, but in the people of God's eye. To put it plainly, we as church folks got to learn how to let stuff go. Uh, whatever bad thing we know about somebody from their past uh, should not limit them from being in the presence of God as we join these assemblies. Uh, so in other words, all have sinned and come short uh, of the glory of God. What are the consequences of disobedience in the body of Christ? We clearly hear the voice of God and what he's saying in his word and when he speaks to us in our personal walk. But what happens when babes in Christ observe the negative attitudes and actions of so-called believers? It does more damage than it does good because oftentimes people who are not strong in hearing the voice of God allow every single excuse to discourage them for doing what they already know God has told them to do. Uh, it's just like two children that are listening to the same parent, uh, but the child is watching the bad behavior of the sibling uh, instead of listening to the voice of the parent. Uh, this is how we act when we are in church. We already know what God has said in his word, uh, but we're looking at our bad sisters and brothers uh, and their negative attitudes uh, to say that he hit me first. Touch names that there are consequences. When I was growing up in my house, we all had chores. Mm -hmm. right. My Amen. mom and dad worked hard. They worked first shift, second shift, and third shift. And even when they were working second shift and got off at 12 o'clock midnight, when they got home from Greenwood at 12.45, that trash had better be taken right. out, Amen. those dishes had better be washed, and that floor had better be mopped. Yeah. Each assignment of each chore was given to each child before they went to work, and they didn't matter who missed their chores assignment. They expected everybody to have done what they said to have done. So when it was my turn to wash dishes, my brother and sister would sometimes slack off. They would say, well, since Tony's going to wash the dishes, he might as well go ahead and take out the trash and mop the floor. But when I said, I'm not going to do anything more than what mom and daddy asked me to do. And so when they got home, when the other two chores weren't done, all three of us got to work. Some of y'all didn't grow up like that. That was just me. Sometimes we have to pay the consequences for what other folk have done. And because we don't understand that, we fail to listen to God. We are just watching what other people are doing. Mm. Yeah. Consequences are so serious that they not only impact the present generation, but generations to come. Your, your failure to praise God not only impacts those who are watching you now, but it also impacting the, the future praise of those that are behind you. Because we are creatures of not what we hear. We are creatures of copying what we see. A real relationship with Jesus only matters when there is a radical intent on behalf of the praiser. In other words, some of us have got to learn how to respell the word push. Many of us think pushing is moving one object from one place to another, but pushing is praising God until something happens. How many of us came in today with a push? In spite of what they may be going through, in spite of the wrong that they may see others doing, you you still are willing to push away from the pull of the world and push closer to the voice of heaven that tells you that you are my sheep and you know my voice and no man shall ever pluck you out of my hand. Just because I got a real relationship. If we are not serious about following Jesus, then why follow him at all? Jesus loves us because he wants to please his daddy. And when he has the intent of being obedient and pleasing his father, he's not worried about what people are saying about him or not even saying to him because he wants to accomplish his number one goal. That's right. Amen. Look at your neighbor and ask him, say, why are you here today? John chapter 10 carefully illustrates the unbelief of the Jews. This was a festival that we now know of today as Hanukkah. And because it was in the winter months, in the month of December, because of the cold, Jesus and the others are on the shelter of Solomon's colonnade. Here the Jews challenge him again as they rather he is really the Son of God. 
whether or not he really is the Christ. They are frustrated and they that he will not make a clear statement and if he does, they will immediately jump to the wrong conclusions. You know, some people got it twisted about you. They think they got you figured out. They see what they want to see in you, but they do not see what God sees. Jesus did not give them what they wanted because even if he did, the Bible tells us that they, they would not even listen to him anyway. They find Jesus' claim of closeness to God as outrageous blasphemy. And again, they threaten to stone him. There have been so many attempts on his life that Jesus retreats to the east of Jerusalem. He stays in the area where John the Baptist used to preach, just beyond the Jordan River. John's teaching there had never been confirmed by miracles, but people can see that all he said about Jesus was coming true. Jesus is the good shepherd who knows his sheep and is also becoming the Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. Anybody can go back through your catalog or either through your memory books and look at old pictures and progress and see how far God has brought you. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that God has had you all in his hands. Look at what he did for you just on April 17th. He woke you up this morning and he started you on your way. He put blood in your veins and breath in your body, but we still do not honor the scripture that says, let everything that have breath Praise the Lord. Jesus had worked miracles. He turned water to wine. He had healed the sick. He had preached uh, the gospel. He had even took two fish uh, and five barley loaves uh, and fed 5,000. But the Pharisees uh, did not see these as signs uh, from God because uh, it was not in their heart to receive uh, the words that were coming from uh, their own scriptures. Uh, and so it is with us today. Uh, many of us can hear something good but only see what we want to see. Many of us can hear something good, but we can turn it into something bad because of our negative self-perception or our negative attitude. Touch your neighbor and say, God ain't in there. How do we practice awesome obedience? Three lessons that we're going to take with us today, and I promise you that it will bless you for not only today, but for the life to come. The first lesson is, is that we got to trust God's truth. Touch the name and say, trust the Lord. Lord. Verse 25 says, I did tell you and you don't believe. The works that I do are in my Father's name. Testify about me. In other words, what more does God have to do in the life of a Christian to elevate our faith? The songwriter said, if he never does anything else, he's already done enough. Many people are counting the blessings that they did not receive instead of counting the blessings that they've already received. If you were to look at your birthday and look at your age and multiply it times 365, that means that you have thousands upon thousands of blessings that you haven't already counted. Every day is a gift from God. That's why we say that it's called a present. That means that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Instead of looking back at what he didn't do that I wanted him to do, I thank him for what he's already doing right now. And he's not worried about the lack of trust you had on yesterday. He wanted to see that you got some trust in him today. Because the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. learned a long time ago from watching our people and wondering why it takes so much for us to praise God. And I discovered it, I looked at it, and I began to understand that many people focus more on tragedy than they do on triumph. And psychologically, it's called recency syndrome. And what recency syndrome says is that once a tragedy has occurred, when the mind has not healed, the mind is subconsciously convinced that the same tragedy will occur again. This is why some people still live in 9-11 over and over again, even though it happened 15 years ago. Uh, 
We spent more money and more soldiers and more lives were lost in Afghanistan and Iraq than all of the people that died on September 11th combined. And that's what we're doing today in our spiritual walk. We're living a 9-11 every day in our minds, even though instead of trusting in the goodness of the Lord. Yes, you had a bad marriage. Yes, you walked out of school. Yes, your children walked out on you. Yes, your son went to jail. Yes, you had got fired from your job. But in spite of it all, 9-11 is over, and you got to trust that the Lord is good. Key word in verse 25 is believe. Comes from the word pisteo, which means to trust. It literally means to have Christian faith. And as you mature in your walk with God, you will begin to decrease in what you think and allow trust to rise up and increase in how God thinks. I understand that you're human and that you have something called an opinion. But opinions are like eyeballs. Everybody has them. But you got to realize that it's not about what you think. As a Christian, your faith should be reflecting how God sees the situation. Amen. Amen. If I didn't have God in my life, I would be lost with like a ship without a sail. Amen. Everything that he told me is true. Yes. And it will come to pass. Amen. But I got so many bad little brothers and sisters that are not interested in doing anything that mama and daddy say. They're only interested in what they want. And they're trying to influence me. As a matter of fact, they're telling me that if I don't do what they say, that they're going to beat me up. They're telling me if I don't do what they say, they're not going to be my friend anymore. They're telling me that if I don't do what they say, that they are going to leave me out in the cold and bully me. Most of us always give in to the bully instead of trusting in the truth by faith. Secondly, we have to try to listen. Just never say try to listen. You just got to encourage people who are already Christian that they have to not only give the preacher their hand and God their heart, but you got to lean in in the midst of all the noise. We all can sing at the same time, but we can't all talk at the same time. And some of us are still confused and distracted from the voice of God because of all of the noise that are around us. Noise on CNN, noise on MSNBC, noise on WYFM, noise on 107.3 Jam, noise at work and noise at home and noise all in every place that you go because if we say that 77% of the people in America are Christian, why is a nation who is majority Christian not listening to the voice of God. Amen. You're right. That's right. Jesus said in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I almost cried when I read this verse. I said, either Jesus is talking about a very small group of people, or either people are lying on Jesus. Who are those sheep that Jesus is talking about? In 2016, where it's almost every pastor I talk to that talks about the same problem. How do you get people who are already part of the church to do the work of the church? There's one problem. The sheep ain't listening. Matter of fact, most of them not even sheep at all. Most of them are goats. And if you know the difference between a sheep and a goat, a goat will eat anything you put in front of it. A goat makes a lot of noise. A goat is a nasty animal. And a goat does not follow the shepherd. Right. Jesus wasn't talking about the goats. He's talking about the sheep 
who hear his voice because a sheep is a very dependent creature. It cannot make it to where it needs to go to the greener pastures unless it has guidance. And that's why it's important for us to be in the body of Christ and as we seek to develop our faith, we have to understand that in this life in the same gospel, Jesus said you will have trials and tribulations. The word listen comes from the word akua, which means to hear, obey and to understand. If you see something that you don't understand, as a Christian, you're supposed to ask questions. You're supposed to be curious as to what things mean. When you see a man who for 65 years of his life lived as Bruce John, and all of a sudden now he wants to be Caitlin John, as a Christian, you should ask about that. Say, Pastor, what does that mean? Why is ESPN giving him the Arthur Ashe of Courage Award? Why are we allowing things that are not tolerated by God in his words to continue to be slapped in our face like we are a bunch of stepchildren and we can't even say nothing about men who want to dress like women and go into women's restrooms? Why is it that the church got to be quiet when the world is screaming and yelling, kiss my behind? Christians ain't listening. We want to be accepted instead of being right with God. My sheep know my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Touch them say try to listen. Now before I leave this part, let me tell you, it ain't easy. When you're around a lot of noisy people. Y'all yeah. know those people that when you call them on the phone and you can put the phone down and put something in the microwave and come back, they still talking. Some of y'all know you. Talk, 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 talk. You got the TV on, you got the radio on. I mean, you got your Pandora playing on your smartphone and all this stuff going on, all this noise, and you're trying to figure out what is God saying to me in this situation? And you just got to lean in. Matter of fact, cut all that other stuff off. Tell them you'll call them back. They ain't going to stop talking anyway. And go to his word. And look at what it says. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Uh -huh. Jesus is talking to two groups of people. He's talking to the Pharisees who were his enemies. Uh -huh. But he's also talking to the disciples who are his friends. Right. Right. And my brothers and sisters, later on in the story, the Bible tells us that he told them that when they were in the garden, that they were going to strike the shepherd and the sheep would scatter. My brothers and sisters, just because you are a follower of Christ does not mean that you're going to listen to him all the time. It means that you hear his voice enough that when you are led astray, that when he calls you, that you will answer him and come running right back to him because he's the only one that can get you out of your situation. Amen. That's right. Trust God's truth. Just mm -hmm. say, try to listen. But thirdly, treasure God's hand. What do I mean by that? Treasure God's hand. Verse 29 says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Back when I was in high school, and I used to read the Bible every night before I went to bed. I had a call from God to preach at age 17, but I didn't want people to know that I was called to be a preacher. I wanted to fit in. But one thing I did know about this scripture is that I would often use it to illustrate the people that once saved, always saved. In other words, God knows, number one, who's already saved. But just because people experience trials, tribulations, and tragedies does not mean that they're not in the will of God. 
<laughs> because in spite of what you actually may realize, the diameter of this planet is some almost 25,000 miles around. So while God has you in his hands in Greenville, he also has people in his hands in Darfur in the western part of Sudan. He also has my sister-in-law's family in her hands in the Philippines. All around this world, simultaneous tragedies and triumphs are going on, and God's got it all in his hands. Even when we were little children, we learned the song, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got you and me in his hands. But in spite of uh, what the word already teaches us, uh, is that salvation is not up to us, uh, and it's up to God. Uh, and it takes us to trust in him uh, to be the source of our salvation. Uh, we tend to want to exclude people uh, from the best blessings of God uh, instead of bringing people into the family. Uh, and that problem is pr primarily based on the root issue, uh, is that we don't believe that God has enough blessings uh, to go around. Whether you believe it or not, God's got everything we need in the palm of his hands. How do we know that? Because the Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The Bible says he has founded it upon the seas and has established it upon the floods. And it says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And says that he has clean hands and a pure heart. Key word in verse 29 is snatch. Comes from the word harpezo, which means to seize. It literally means to snatch away. But most importantly, it means to gain control over. And what we have in the body of Christ is a gathering all over the world of people who hear the voice of God, but do not have control over their own situation. Let me say it this way. Something didn't go your way this week. And it's got your mind on the other side of time. And when you get back into actually hearing the voice of God, what puts you in the right place for understanding not only who he is, but where your role is in the relationship, is that he has everything in control. Let me tell you how much God loves all of us. He loves us so much that he allows us to experience and observe tragedy, but at the same place, he gives us a, a testimony at the end of that tragedy to realize that through it all, we were still in his hands. Yes. My brothers and sisters, I'm a witness today that I can experience some ups and downs in life. But still, in spite of what people may say about my Jesus, or even say about me, I'm going to treasure the blessings that God has already given me. Because I know that in the end, the good outweighs the bad. Right. Amen. Listen to what Jesus says to the Pharisees. It says that he says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand because what? I and the Father are one. God, our great owner, mm -hmm. the sheep of whose pasture we are by his creation, has blessed his son, Jesus Christ, to be our good shepherd. Mm -hmm. He has all that care of his people that a good shepherd has to his flock. Right. In his care, the true believer is eternally secure. For the hand that was wounded at the hand of our Creator, close in, 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 in his all in his omnipotent power, he's trying to tell us that time is filled with swift transition. The hymn writer said, not on earth unmoved can stand. It's telling us that by faith we ought to build our hopes on things eternal. Guess what? We ought to hold to God's unchanging hand. I got good news for somebody here today that's being tested to, uh, to have their focus uh, in all types of directions. Uh, modern marketing calls it attention capital. Uh, there are all sources of media that are trying uh, to grasp our attention. Uh, social media and uh, television media, radio media uh, and print media are all coming in uh, to our mailboxes, our emails. Uh, we call it junk mail. We call it bulk mail. Everybody's uh, 
trying to grasp your attention. But in spite of who all is trying to, to talk to you, you ought to put all those voices as secondary. And the voice of God should be primary. And how do you know that it's the voice of God? It's when it lines up with everything that is already in his word. I'm so glad that he gave me a mind to not only listen to his voice when he speaks to me late at night, but I can go back and try the Spirit, by the Spirit. I can read his word and know that a yes to God is better than a no to the world. A yes to the world. Story told about a man named Mr. John Kenneth Galbraith. Mr. John Kenneth Galbraith in his autobiography, A Life in Our Times, he provided for us an illustration. This was an illustration uh, of a devotion of Miss Emily Gloria Wilson, uh, who at the time was his family's housekeeper. Mr. John Kenneth Galbraith had told us uh, that it had been a weary day, uh, and he asked the housekeeper, Miss Emma, uh, to hold all his telephone calls uh, while he lay down and he took a nap. Uh, shortly thereafter, the phone rang. And on the phone was President Lyndon B. Johnson, who was calling from the White House in Washington, D.C. And then on the phone, President Johnson said, get me Mr. Ken Galbraith. This is President Lyndon B. Johnson. And Miss Emma said back to him, Mr. President, I'm sorry. He is sleeping. He gave me specific instructions not to disturb him. And she, the president said, well, wake him up. I want to talk to him. And she said, no, Mr. President, I work for him. I do not work for you. And when I called the president back, Mr. Galbraith said, he said without any hesitancy, tell that one Miss Emma, I want her here working for me at the White House. And I gotta close and tell somebody that's what awesome obedience is. It doesn't matter who's on line number two. All matters is is who's on line number one. Is there anybody here that's got a praise on the inside that you heard Jesus? He was on the main line. And you can call him up and tell him what you want. Most of us can't have Miss Emma's testimony because we're running over here. We're running over there. We're hopping on one foot to keep the other foot warm. But all you got to do is hear his words and say, my sheep. Hear my voice, and no man is going to ever take them out of his hands. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what happened on yesterday. All I care about is right now, and right now, I know you're in his hands. How do I know that you're in his hands? It's because I'm standing here beside you. I can see you got breath in your lungs. You got blood in your veins. And through it all, you're still here. Hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. I told you in the beginning to shake two people's hands and ask them a question. And that question was, do you listen to Jesus? And if anybody here is still able to reach over to that neighbor and ask them a third time, then do you listen to Jesus? How do I know that somebody here is listening to Jesus? Because he woke you up this morning. He started you on your way. He opened the doors of the church. And you said, I will bless the Lord at all times. 
times and his praise shall continue to be in my mouth. Is there anybody here that's got a yes to that question? One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. I got a yes. I got a yes for God. I hear his voice and he loves me. He loves me still. In spite of what I'm wrong, he still loves me. Has anybody got a yes, God? Anybody got a thank you, Jesus? Anybody here says hallelujah? Anyhow, I'm so glad that he loves me. I want you to tell him yes. yes. Say yes. yes. Say yes. 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 Hey. Yes, sir. Tell me what he said. Yes. When you ask them, do you listen to Jesus? Yes. Yes. How many of y'all ask somebody next to you to say yes? Yes. Yes. That's all we need. Hey, hey, hey. See, some of us still trying to get everybody. <laughs> and that was never God's goal to save That's everybody. Right. That's right. Amen, Pastor. He said, whosoever will. Well. Who will? Let him come. Let him come. Right. Let us say. Amen. Time is filled with swift transition.